speaker for this uh, session is uh, Professor uh, uh, Talai Onan, who taught in the uh, departments of both the Department of Archaeology and Ancient Near Eastern Cultures and uh, in the Department of Art History in the Hebrew University in Jerusalem, um, and specializes in ancient Near Eastern art, and already in 1986 published a catalog of uh, items from the Moshe Dayan collection in the uh, Israel Museum, and uh, the Triumph of the Symbol, it was published in uh, uh, 2005, and there are a lot of other things, the Kuntilata, uh, co-publisher of the Kuntilata Adrud uh, materials. Uh, for today, she's spoken, she's chosen to speak about, I have made a figurine of my warlock and witch, kind of reminds us of something we heard in the morning, um, on the uh, um, apa, uh, mm. Apotropaic, apotropaic, excuse me, yes, character of the, uh, um, of the visual art, of visual form in ancient Near Eastern art. So please. Good afternoon to everybody. Um, the title here, I thank for it uh, to Professor, uh, Professor Tzvi Abush. Um, and I'll go on. Celebrating 25 years for the publication of Yaakov Klein and Shin Shifra volume of the Hebrew translations of Mesopotamian literature is as indeed a significant day for all of us. Not only because of the highly superb translations they offered us, also for the impact they had on wider uh, educated Israeli circles, as well as, of course, uh, uh, on our academic uh, community. Shin Shifra, the pen name of Shifra Shmuel Levitz, was a very dear friend of mine. The Hebrew uh, quotation from the Maklu Oath, this uh, uh, Hebrew quotation, not only perfectly fits my talk here on the ancient Near Eastern material or visual apotropaic means, it also illustrates the qualities of the translations that maintain the original vocal vocalization of the translations, a possible option perhaps when translating from one Semitic language to the other. Indeed, the magic ritual is enhanced here by the sound of the translated utterance through which Kashapia u Kashaptia became Hamechashefa Mechashefa Asher Kishfuni, already magic. The latter indeed presents a vocal onomatopoeic magic tool. The sense of sight of, on which I focus here works similarly. It was mobilized in the pictorial renderings of the ancient Near East as a primary performative means intended to affect supernatural divine entities in all matters related to human beings. Sorry. Um, the, uh, this magic ritual, as is well known, finds its parallel in Exodus 32. The power of the graven image in, in both cases is so overwhelming, immense, that in order to overcome it, it must be eliminated. Uh, oops. Um, not only the visual form are to be, to be abolished, either, either a golden bull or a probable wood made figurines, the very material of these images are to be exterminated by burning them and then grinding them, their remains into powder and diffuse them in water. The genesis of material visuals as tools used by the ancient to connect with perceived unreal, unreal beings or personified natural phenomena probably originated in human consciousness and unconsciousness mingled with aspect of cognition within the sphere of belief and religion. These aspects probably formed the quest for early human beings to connect supernatural forces perceived as capable of supporting them, granting them beneficial and auspicious blessings on the one hand, and expelling whatever danger or evil they have surrounded, they were, they were surrounded with. Indeed, 
man-made visual forms attested from almost the dawn of civilization seems to be the earlier assets of human conceptualization evinced by archaeological records reflecting non-material conceptualized human culture. As after all, with the lack of, with the lack of or only in the gear records relating to assets such as dance, cult, music, singing, language, and of course writing, we are mainly left with records of human of man-made visual forms often turned termed art. The term art, however, was introduced into Western vocabulary by Dante Alighieri in the 14th century AD in the Divine Comedy. Since then, the notion of Western art was modified and develop, developed in many aspects to reach what is considered modern art today, from which most of the researchers dealing with art come from. The pertinent point distinguishing modern consideration of art is who was or were the addressee all the addresses of the ancient art we are dealing with here. While modern art, while in modern art the addresses are human eyes and minds, the art of the ancient Near East, ancient Egypt, facets of Greek art continued in Islamic period, medieval Christian Europe, and contemporary traditional non-Western man-made visual expressions the addressees were and are divine entities. Thus, using the term art for both modern and ancient visual expressions may. <laughs> Sorry. <clears throat> Thus, uh, using the term art for both modern and ancient visual expression may blur at times our understanding of ancient art. The agency of pictorial representation was thoroughly dealt with by the British anthropologist Alfred Gell as early as 1992. However, since Gell focused on the sociological aspect of the power of the visual art rather than on its role in religious belief systems, and as he did not even mention the ancient Near Eastern art, hardly Egypt or even Greece, this contribution, his contribution to our specific uh, concern here is somewhat limited. The notion that the visual form in the ancient Near East was essentially directed to a metaphysic addressee is not new. Zerna Baharani, among others, advocated already in 2003 for the performative character of the pictorial representations in Mesopotamia. <clears throat> in the following, I will present a few categories of Mesopotamian visual renderings that exemplify their performative character, targeted uh, the eyes of the divine. Toward the end of this talk, I will shortly, very shortly, a touch upon the possible bearing, bearings of the apotropaic character of Near Eastern imagery on three distinctive features typifying it. One, the anonymity of the Mesopotamian artisan, the Umano. Second, the possible connection between the apotropaic nature of the visual form and the non-mimetic character of the art of the ancient Near East. And three, the virtual absence of a continuous, myth, continuous mythic or epic pictorial narratives. Okay, thank you, sorry. Um, we begin with this relief presenting two ethyphalic men from the ninth, uh, I just want you to pay attention, it is from the ninth millennium, okay? Long ago. Uh, uh, okay. One man at the side of a bull, the other between two raging, intimidating felines, that considering, um, considering a other contemporary rendering may present alongside a human worldly demonstration of power, a plea to a metaphysics entities to provide strength 
combined with May vigor because of the etephalic um, um, rendering. So, okay. Um, that the pictorial representation did not aim to, to reach human beings is events, events, for example, by rock relief situated at remote geographical locations, often at such height that whoever passes by can hardly even observe them. Here, the rock relief of Anu Banini, king of the Lulubi, assigned circa the turn of the third millennium. The people standing on the current pass at the foot of the Zagos Ridge here cannot see anything of the scene. Indeed, it was not intended for humans, only for the demands. Similarly, similarly, the many reliefs of Sennacherib commem commemorating the water systems he erected northeast of, northeast of Nineveh on the Zagros western slope, that included the horrible report on the flooding of Babylon, could hardly be seen by people as they were again aimed uh, at the divine. In other cases, in other cases, as the Uruk vases a vase that depicts an institutional cult procession presenting aspects of abundance, the rigorous hierarchical composition of the long road that faces a female image, a goddess or her a human priestess stand in, emphasizes the thing is aimed here as a divine entity for either a quest for an abundance or thanksgiving for having it. Still at Uruk, still at Uruk, um, uh, at the Anna Persinct, the steep stairway leading to the white temple on the ziggurat, it was inlaid with colored clay cones exhibiting alternating motifs of triangles, rhomboids, and zigzags, emblem of female productive organs and running water. These are familiar beneficial and auspicious icons continued in the Near Eastern imagery until the first millennium, where to bless whoever climbed up towards the ziggurat, again, visual aimed at the divine, either as a quest of abundance or a thanksgiving for heaven. It. Regarding a, a monuments representing martial a nar narrative, as here on the stele of the tomb, consider the first martial narrative. Ningirsu is a primary addressee, as it is he who is the one responsible for the victory over Uma, shown carrying the defeated warriors from Uma in the net. I hope you can observe it on the second leg. Uh, in the center, uh, the picture. And of course, here, Ishtar is addressed as a net with the defeated rivals of Sargon is handed over to her. You can see the remnant, only the remnants of her hand, hand, uh, hand and uh, one of the maces she carries on her back. In other cases of martial monumental representations, oh, sorry, it's not good. Okay. As on the stele of the Dusha from Eshnuna, we may safely attribute Adad as the primary divine addressee to whom the inscription is dedicated, although it is a, a debatable if he is actually presented on the monument itself. On the left is a small terracotta plaque depicting a generic royal image as indicated by his, high, his, his wide brimmed hat. Like the Dusha, this figure is represented as a triumphant king trampling his rival. The plaque belongs to the large group of old Babylonia terracottas that function as amuletic charms. Thus, the addressee here is no, no doubt the divine entity. Another large category of artifact whose function was to connect with the divine is comprised of statues of worshippers, <laughs> high officials, priests, priestesses, scribes, and kings, here from third millennium Mari, whose role was to face the images of the gods, their ultimate addresses. I turn now 
to, uh, I turn now to what can be considered, I think, the largest group of small artifacts, seals and ceilings, whose amuletic function manifests through three main features. The materials they are made of, their visual depiction at times accompanied by inscription, and their replications, the possibility of their visuals to be repeated over and over again by their impressions. As advocated by Otmar Kills, Sills had an important amuletic role alongside their bureaucratic, fu bureaucratic functions as well as their identity markers role. The repetition of motifs when rolled or impressed in the, in, in the case of stamp seals, combined with the beneficial property of a given stone as a lapis lazuli here signifying uh, probably the sky, coupled with their agentum visual compositions and motifs, enhance their apotropaic power, power as artifacts directed to the divine to grant blessing and protection upon whoever uses them. As formulated by Irene Winter, pictorial repetition lifts a scene from the actual or temporal to the recurrent and therefore infinite and everlasting. In certain types of um, cylinder cells, mainly from the old Babylonian period, miniature icons fill the background of the artifact of the impression. These were coined filling motifs, a term I assume inspired by the 19th century AD perspective on 7th, 6th century orientalized Greek imagery with, with its condensed icon wrongly assumed to manifest a horror vacuum. The so-called filling motif on a cylinder seals, however, are to be seen as a version of the visual repetition that, as said, increases the function of the apotropaic icons. For example, for example, um, repeated replication of divine emblems create an infinite and everlasting pictorial illusion, stretching at times on large surfaces applied to human or divine images or cover large architectural components seen here on number two in the middle. <clears throat> Repetition of performative visuals such as the Ayaru, for example, probably a the rosette, commonly taken as an icon alluding to female deities among them Ishtar. Here on the left, on the figure of, uh, of riding Ashurbanipal from Nineveh, and on the right, a, dent, a dense rosette pattern carved on the dress of an unidentified goddess from a uh, Karkemish. Another type of, uh, another type, another example of a large category of artifacts used as performative agents in providing protection and blessing are jewels. Here are two neo Assyrian kings. Each is wearing a jewel or, a, or jewels. Uh, Adad Nirari on your left has a large Maltese-like cross pendant possibly symbolizing Marduk. And Tiglat Pileser on the right wearing a necklace strung with five divine symbols. Following Beate von Gottleisten, who interprets a similar necklace worn by Ashurnatserpal as granting the king divine protection while in battle, such performative role of jewelry can also be attributed here. However, the role of jewelry as performative means granted from super realistic entities was not only a request for protection in the land of the living. It, all, it, was, also, it was also a vital need for staying in the Kakari La Tau and probably on the liminal way leading to the, to the land of the dead. Outstanding collections of exquisite jewelry revealed in both the third millennium tomb of Pu'abu et Ur, as represented here, and Nimrod in the tombs of the Neo-Assyrian royal consorts, 
speak for the performative power of jewels regarding death. The immense accumulation of wealth kept in such tombs cannot only be considered as a demonstration of rule and social hierarchy as considered by many, and must have been a quest for divine help. It shows that a significant function of Jul was to safeguard the deceased on the way to and in the beyond that manifest the deep human anxiety regarding death as so well expressed by Gilgamesh. These tombs of human queens bring me to another queen whose tomb, whose tomb, sorry, whose tomb however, will never be found. Uh, 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 yes. I refer, of course, to the goddess Ishtar and her adventurous descent to the netherworld. There are probably many hidden reasons for her visit to the beyond. Nevertheless, one characteristic feature Ishtar and human uh, beings share here is a fear of the, of the beyond. Hence, the text, the various uh, uh, versions of the descent of Ishtar, emphasized the, the jewelry that was supposed to protect her. As a result, when the jewels were removed from her body, she was exposed to various physical syndromes. Out of the six types of objects she wore or held, more than seven actual, so to speak, pieces were jewels. She was equipped with similar jewels of, of dead humans, objects to protect her. By removing them, the great lady became vulnerable. She was hardly released from the beyond, and of course, had to pay a really grand, grand prize. What puzzles me here, considering, so, sorry, considering uh, Ishtar, uh, is that the above mentioned human anxiety is shared here by the ma a major goddess, as implied by the fact Ishtar had to have jewels here and in the versions emphasize them. Does this hint a somewhat limited power of the divine, perhaps only regarding a female di a divinity? And now to uh, this bedroom imagery. Although we have only very few material records, it seems that we may consider a special category of apotropaic themes that belong to a bedroom imagery. I have only two examples of this, but I think they worth mentioning. On your left is a, a reconstruction proposed by the meticulous work of Beatrice Muller Margeron of fragmentary wall paintings from Mari. These are attributed to the second story of the palace, considered as a private royal suite. The two human figures present a, com a combating king. On the left, he overcomes a lion. On the right, he defeats a human rival and treats another one. Both cases present a well-known ancient Near Eastern metaphor, the lion which stands for a human rival. On your right are similar combats of the Assyrian king with lions found among small reliefs on the floor of room S at the North Palace of Ashurbanipal. Room S is removed from the public and official parts of the palace and considered as a private royal suite. These small reliefs and some others are considered as originally belonging to the second story room S1. They recall the Mari paintings in their architectural context and themes, although they are much more elaborate and sophisticated. On the bottom, the king performs a ritual lib a libation over the corpses of four lions. The epigraph above it informs that the king killed the lions with a, with a bow given to him by Ishtar. The killing of the lions, representing a serious rival, is hence part of a cultic ritual. I remind you the ninth millennium relief we began with the troublemaker one <laughs> that presented a cephalic man 
and an intimidating lion, combining together physical strength and potency. I suggest similar notions are transmis transmitted also here, although the manhood marker is not exposed. The presentation of Ashurbanipal overcoming the lion in, in room S1 obviously, obviously uh, demonstrates the king's physical strength. The architectural context of this theme, a bedroom, implies an added aspect of the royal power is involved here. Male virility. Surely a real must for any monarchy dynasty to be asked from supernatural entities. To conclude, as mentioned, I contend that the distinctive apropaic nature of ancient Near Eastern visual imagery had implication on three of the characteristics of uh, 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 ancient Near Eastern art. Um, first, the anonymity of the Mesopotamian artisan, the Umanu. We do not know who they were. The Umanu craftsmen were, over, were working according to known and age-old film regulation. They were not expected to be innovative or express their own ideas about the artifacts they made. As the role of the artifact, the graven image was basically a means for receiving divine support, blessings, and protections, the Umanu as individual did not matter. An express, ex expression of the ancient Near East disregard towards the Umanu is perhaps revealed within the cultic procedure of the Mishpi and Pit P ceremony for the induction of divine image, through which the hands of the human craftsmen were ceremoniously cut off. Indeed, the opposite of notions demonstrated in modern art probably originated in late Renaissance and perhaps had some descendants in Greek art. The second characterizing feature connected with the protopaic nature of ancient Near East is its non-mimetic character that matches the emphasis on its apotropaic essence. Third, the visual absence of a continuous mythic or epic pictorial narrative that contrasts the large, uh, large textual corpora uh, in the, uh, is instead in Near Eastern imagery only presented in few selected visuals that basically functions as apotropaic myths directed to the divine. As continuous mythic or epic narrative are considered a pedag pedagogic tool that targets the human ears and minds, there seem to be no place for such representations, continuous narrative uh, uh, um, display. Narratives, instead, were in meant to enhance a collective ideology of human co community that does not accord with the core substance of the apotropaic image, imagery of the ancient Near, Near East. So, when did the ancient Near East religions adopt visual narratives as a community tool directed to their communities? Well, it seems only after the divinities left their sacred abodes on earth and the temples transformed into community center where the believers could synagogue gather together as finally uh, shown on the actually earliest depiction of a monotheistic synagogue or a monotheistic uh, um, institution at Dora Iropus in the middle of the third century AD. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any comments, questions? There's a lot of question here. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so the next uh, session will begin at uh, a quarter to four. So go enjoy.
whatever's left of the coffee.